Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life, where we talk all things true crime. Your one-stop shop, and I guess I would also call it like the red flag destination. We're always talking about all of the red flags we see in these cases. So if you enjoy today's case video and you enjoy this channel and you think it's one that you want to support and tune into again, make sure you hit that subscribe button below and turn your notification bell to on so that you get notified of new videos as I upload them and new live streams as they happen in real time when we're covering ongoing cases. And for all of my returning subscribers, welcome back. I'm so happy to have you guys here today. And as always, thank you so much for your continued support. The case we're talking about today is one that I personally thought that I knew about until I really re started researching it. And then I learned about all of these new details and all of this new information that blew me away and I had no idea about when I initially heard about the case because it just happened last year. So Madeline Allen is a 19-year-old student at Snow College in Utah. In early December 2021, Madeline began talking to a guy online through the messaging app Kick. Kick is a free instant messaging app, kind of like WhatsApp, that allows users to really maintain their privacy when they're chatting with friends or family because they do it over Wi-Fi or they can use cell phone data too, I think. But the app only requires that users sign in with an email address to really ensure increased privacy. So after chatting back and forth, Madeline decided to meet up with her digital crush on December 13th, 2021. And at approximately 9.22 p.m., she headed out of her dorm at Snow College and headed out to meet him. However, her parents, Jonathan and Tanya, became extremely concerned the following morning after they received a very vague text from Madeline that read, I love you, and was sent at 7.20 a.m., an early morning text, and a statement that felt unusual to the parents. They immediately contacted their cell phone provider, which traced this text to a small town about 87 miles south of Madeline's college campus. So why was Madeline so far away from her house and so early in the morning? Why was she sending these text messages? And was this really Madeline texting her parents? So guys, let's dive right in. Tend to life with Annie Elise starts right now. So it's now been 12 hours since Madeline left her Snow College dorm room in Utah to meet up with this mystery man that she met online. At 7.20 a.m. that following morning, her parents had received a very unusual text message from Madeline at just 19 years old and felt weird about it, thought something was wrong, so they decided to contact their cell phone provider. Upon doing so, they learned that Madeline wasn't at school in her dorm like expected. In fact, she was 87 miles away. Now, while normally an I love you text and a college girl being out all night may not seem super alarming or out of the ordinary even, it was for Madeline and her parents knew that something wasn't right, especially because Madeline didn't have a car, she didn't have a driver's license, and she wouldn't have been able to get 87 miles away from anywhere on her own. Parents immediately alerted the authorities of this cryptic text message and the situation. They also informed the police that Madeline was said to be facing a major mental health crisis and needs help. Maddie's roommates at the Central Utah School also reported her missing when she didn't return home the next day. Police and investigators immediately reached out to the school and began working the investigation to find Madeline. Snow College was extremely cooperative and immediately wanted to assist in any way that they could. After providing surveillance video to the police, it showed Madeline leaving her dorm room in Snow Hall just before 9.30 p.m. She was wearing a skirt and a light-colored white jacket while carrying a plastic bag and her cell phone in the other hand. That same day, the morning of the text message to her parents on December 14th, Snow College announced that the police were searching for Madeline, who had been last seen at her residence at the dorms. They also issued a public statement that read, Snow College Public Safety is working with law and state law enforcement, as well as the FBI. Police are asking anyone who was in the area and saw anything suspicious to contact them at 435-283-7170. Anyone with information about Madeline's whereabouts is asked to contact the police. So everyone began searching for Madeline. People were posting on social media, people were gathering in search parties, and everyone was trying to find out what may have happened to this sweet, vulnerable 19-year-old girl. 
Local, state, and federal law enforcement officers became involved in the search for Madeline, and after four days had passed, on Friday, December 17th, they held a press conference. And in this press conference, her father and these law enforcement officials made a public plea to help find his daughter, Madeline. He also had a message that he said directly to Maddie. Yeah, we are at Snow College, just outside of the hall where Maddie lives, and this is where she was last seen, walking out of the building Monday night. Tonight, her family wants her home. In an effort to increase the speed and success in our search for Maddie, we want to share a little bit about who she is, why she means so much to us, and why we're concerned. We hope that better understanding of her and getting to know her as we do may help all who are willing and able to help. Uh, Maddie was born prematurely uh, at a pound and a half at only 26 weeks. At her birth, she experienced a brain bleed and had a number of other issues at that time. And since then, she's faced a myriad of challenges, including disability as well as mental and emotional difficulties. And in spite of all this, she's repeatedly overcome these many obstacles. She loves art and music, participated in high school musicals and the Snow College Choir here, and even worked successfully as a lifeguard among other jobs. From the 110 days that she was in the NICU as a baby until today, she has been a fighter. So, dear friends, from our family to yours, and as Maddie's parents, we are asking for your help. If greater awareness of Maddie's story and a picture helps to bring her home, we ask that you please share this with everyone you possibly can. We believe that she's facing a major mental health crisis and she needs our help and we need to find her. Dear Maddie, if you can hear us, you're not alone. Many people are facing similar challenges and have faced challenges like this. We know that you're brave and that you're strong. We see you and we love you beyond our ability to express and we're here for you. And we're anxious for you to come home and be with us for Christmas. Today, Maddie is a student at Snow College where she sings in the choir. Rest assured, we are doing everything we can to find her. Police say on Monday, she walked out of her dorm and into the cold at 9.22 p.m. with a plastic bag, a skirt, and a light white jacket, and they believe her phone. We put a lot of work into tracking those messages. Chief Derek Walk says they don't know where she was headed or whether she's with someone. Everything associated with that would be a speculation but I do hope someone is with her and I hope that they are friendly. The FBI and other agencies are assisting in the investigation. From our family to yours and as Maddie's parents, we are asking for your help. I mean, just absolutely terrifying and heartbreaking, especially right before the holidays when you're supposed to be safe and warm at home with your loved ones, you know, cozy at home to not only have a loved one missing, but for it to be your young daughter who you are concerned about with her mental health as well to not know where she is to not have any idea if she's okay the amount of devastation and turmoil as a parent that you would feel i can't even imagine again especially just because emotions are so heightened when you're that close to the holiday so on the very next day after this press conference on saturday december 18th the search continued and investigators were about to have a lucky break during the search, police used cell phone tower information to further locate Maddie's whereabouts, and that led them to a town in Wayne County, Utah, nearly 90 miles from her college. Law enforcement officials conducted a search through the town of about 500 people and really hit the pavement. I mean, they were knocking on about every single door of anybody who lived in this town. And as police came to a house on Main Street, they spotted a petite woman with blonde hair in the basement of the home, and this instantly set alarms off. They knocked on the door of this home, of course, and a man answered. This man's name was Brent Brown, and he was 39 years old, standing approximately six feet, two inches, and weighing approximately 250 pounds. 
The house was owned by Brent's parents, and Brent told them that he was alone in the house, but he refused to let them in without his parents' permission. A huge red flag. Officials, of course, obtained a search warrant and entered the home just a few hours later that afternoon to search it. And as they were searching, they located a Snow College ID card belonging to Maddie, a clear sign that Maddie was there or, at the very least, had actually been there earlier. So as they continued to search the residence, they saw a woman in the basement, that same one from earlier, who ran out of sight. They followed the woman and followed her, which led them, I guess she led them, to a coal storage area of the basement. And in that coal storage area, they spotted Maddie and she was still alive. There she was, 19 year old missing Maddie, completely covered head to toe in coal and stark naked. But why was she covered in coal and what did this innocent 19 year old girl endure over the last five days? The details that Maddie directly shared with police and the details that were outlined in the affidavit are truly a parent's worst fear and would give even the strongest person nightmares. And there was also about to be a twist in this case that absolutely nobody saw coming and that would floor everyone, myself included. We are grateful to announce that Madeline Allen has been found and reunited with her family. Our our investigative team has spent countless hours following leads, utilizing investigative tools, interviewing others, and analyzing data. That focus, dedicated, selfless, hard work of multiple uh, law enforcement officers paid off last night when Madeline was located. Madeline was taken to a nearby hospital for uh, for an examination after which she was able to interact with her family. One person, Brent Brown, a 39-year-old male from from Utah, has been taken into custody. I'll now take a few questions at this time. Reportedly, Madeline and Brent met in an online chat group earlier in December. The specific chat room they met in was a chat group for bondage. Madeline reportedly agreed and arranged to meet up in person with Brent and have him pick her up from school on that Monday night when she went missing. But as many of us know, catfishing is still all too real. Somebody pretends to be somebody else online, you meet the real version, you're oftentimes disappointed, they either don't look like their photo, they aren't who they said they were, they're a different gender, a different... I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Watch the show Catfish, guys, you'll learn. But it still is a very real thing. And for Madeline, who she thought she was meeting and who she really ended up meeting up with, were two completely different people. Madeline said that after Brent picked her up, his entire demeanor changed. She said that he brought her to his home, made her strip down naked, and didn't allow her to put on any clothes, not a single article of clothing, for the entire duration that she was in captivity. She also said that he took her cell phone away and only allowed her to text her family that one time that very next morning after he had picked her up. He then threw away her phone and wouldn't allow her to speak to anybody. Brent also allegedly took her wallet, threatened to hurt her family, and apparently tied Madeline up while he was at work, only leaving her enough slack to reach food and reach the bathroom. Madeline reported that Brent RAPED'd her several times daily and that it was not consensual and became very violent. She said that she was afraid to leave because he had threatened her family, even despite seeing a report about her disappearance on TV. And that has to be so frightening, especially as a young girl. You're being held captive and you see a news report, a press conference, where your parents are pleading for your safe return home. You know that people are looking for you, but yet you're still there in this dark coal storage area, you know, tied up. And all you want to do is yell out to them and reach out to them and say, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm safe, but help me. And she couldn't. But even more than that, she was fearful to do that because he was threatening to hurt her family. Madeline also claimed that Brent told her he had mailed her cell phone to Arizona so that nobody could find her. And he also apparently later claimed that police had stopped looking for Madeline entirely, which was never true. So what did Brent have to say about all of this? What was his alibi? What was his excuse? What would he tell investigators? 
because Brent was about to talk to them. And Brent was about to admit to everything, but in a completely opposite version of events that Maddie had reported. And it was about to make investigators very confused and this seemingly solved case a lot more blurry. During their investigation, authorities learned that Madeline had been struggling with depression and anxiety and that she did often use dating apps. When they conducted a search of her phone records, it revealed text message exchanges of violent sexual nature and some pretty graphic messaging. Brent allegedly had admitted too to meeting Madeline in a slave domination fetish group, which aligns with that earlier report of the bondage group chat and also aligns with some of these explicit messages that police had found on Madeline's phone. Brent also admitted to picking Madeline up on December 13th, but Brent says that his actions, including taking her phone, tying her up, and threatening her family, were all part of their sexual role play plan, involving this kidnapping scenario as well. He said he did, in fact, have sex with Maddie several times a day, but he told police that it was part of a consensual kidnapping role play, something they had discussed in these dominatrix domination bondage group chats earlier, a fantasy brought to life. So investigators, of course, begin investigating this, not only into the allegations that Maddie's making, but also the allegations that Brent is making. And ultimately, at the end of their investigation, authorities concluded that there was probable cause to believe Madeline was in fact essayed, kidnapped, choked, and that Brent did in fact attempt to conceal her location. Brent was arrested and charged with six felonies, including RAPE, aggravated kidnapping, aggravated essay, and obstructing justice. At the press conference after finding Maddie, her father said that he and his wife dropped to their knees when they learned that she had been rescued. You can also imagine how we must have felt when the chief called me last night. Uh, we, we, in our minds, had a mindset that was a much longer uh, road. And, and yet we got the phone and he called, as he had done many times, and he said, I have her. And... <laughs> We dropped to our knees. We were so grateful, elated. Couldn't describe the feelings that we had. Ahead of Brent's most recent court appearance, Madeline issued her first public statement on Instagram, thanking her supporters and speaking out. Hi guys, um, I just want to thank you so much for... Hi guys, um, I just wanted to thank you so much for your support and your prayers and your fasting while I was missing. Um, just thank you so much. Um, I, I really couldn't have done it without all of you guys. Um, thank you. Um, I probably won't be posting, um, a lot of videos on my YouTube channel for a little bit just because I am working through the healing process right now. Um, but I, it's something I want to continue to do in the future maybe, so, um, I can keep you up to date on that later, but just thank you so much for all your prayers and just everything. Just thank you so much. She said she plans to take a break from posting videos on her YouTube channel and on Instagram for the time being as the family really focuses on healing. A family member of Madeline's has also spoken out and they said, the ordeal that she has been through is dangerous and traumatic, the details of which we have only begun to understand. She is a fighter. She is now a survivor. We are grateful she is with us again so she can now recover. So what are your thoughts on this case, guys? Do you think that this was outright kidnapping and foul play at the hands of Brent? Do you think that this possibly started as role-playing, like he claimed, but at some point it went sideways and took a turn towards reality when Maddie got scared? Do you think that Maddie was complicit, as Brent is suggesting, and that this all just was a fantasy that they wanted to explore in real life? I mean, given the bondage group chat and the explicit messages that police discovered, I do think that it's plausible that perhaps Maddie was interested in testing out a new lifestyle of sorts or, you know, new play, but that maybe it went too far or maybe it became real and she got scared. Because I do think that if she truly was complicit, like Brent is saying, I don't see why he would have had to throw away her cell phone and wouldn't have allowed her to leave. Unless, of course, it was a situation where 
once the role playing, I say role playing, began that she maybe changed her mind and maybe he became scared that she would report him and he would get arrested. So he decided to hold her captive while he figured out his next move. I don't know, guys. I feel like we're going to learn a lot more once the discovery is made public because so many details in this case, given the nature in which she was found, the details of her allegations, her age, her mental state, all of these things, a lot of the details are still very, very private and concealed, and there has not been a lot of information made public. So I don't expect that we will learn a lot of those details until we get to trial because Brent is still going to trial for this. His last hearing was last month and I think his next one is coming up. But I think that we won't learn a lot of those details until we actually get the unsealed affidavits, the discovery, all of the information to really know what this situation truly was. Because I can't help but wonder when they go back through the tech belonging to Brent, had he done this before? Had he messaged with women like this before? Did Maddie ever message like this with people? Did she ever meet up with anybody in the past like this before? And not in any way to suggest that she is not a victim. I wholeheartedly, absolutely believe that she is. I just can't help but wonder if she became a victim on day one when she first got in the car or if she became a victim later on as the situation escalated or until the reality of it set in. And again, I feel like we won't know that and we won't learn those details until this actually makes its way into the courtroom. So I'm going to follow closely because I'm interested to know what the reality of this is. Because again, I thought I knew this case. I heard about this back in December and I was like, oh my gosh, she was found. She's alive. Finally, finally, a happy ending in one of these cases. Come to find out as I'm researching it more, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't anything like I thought it was. And there are just so many other details that roll into it. But still, at the end of the day, even if it is consensual as far as the initial meetup, a 39-year-old man with a 19-year-old girl in a domination setting feels like a recipe for something not good. Uh, So we're going to learn more about that, I'm sure, as we go into the courtroom. But let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on this case. And as always, if you want to follow along or check out the other case videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. It's free, guys. It's um, completely free. So (laughs) subscribe. And also, if you want to support the channel and the video, give this video a thumbs up on your way out. So we will talk again very, very soon because unfortunately, there are no shortage of true crime cases out there. So until the next case, stay safe. Bye.